Okay, so uh, going on from uh, Bill and a news conversation, we're going to go over to um, Craig and Joanne. Uh, Craig Lipset, the co-chair of the Decentralized Trials Research Alliance, uh, will be uh, interviewing uh, Joanne Waters, a managing director from IMC, a, uh, an organization that HitLab has been working closely with um, around uh, the remote uh, monitoring technology solutions uh, and how, it, uh, how it's affecting the current state of uh, patient health outcomes in uh, decentralized trials. Uh, Craig, over to you. Thanks so much, Jerry. It is a pleasure to follow Bill and Anu. What a great and vibrant conversation. I'm hoping and looking forward to having the same here with Joanne. So uh, if you have questions, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to weave your questions right into this conversation. Joanne, welcome. It's great to see you. Nice to see you, Craig. Well, I'm looking forward to this conversation, talking about some remote monitoring technologies and in particular their intersection with clinical trials and decentralized trials. And hopefully over this time, we'll, we'll lean in a little bit around medication monitoring in particular and some of the uh, interesting nuances, some of the unique opportunities and challenges there. Where, where I thought I'd begin, Joanne, just to level set with the audience is just with a bit of definition. Um, and so something I'm asked very frequently about is uh, what is a decentralized trial? How shall we define it? For, so before we jump into this conversation together, I thought it might help to just drop a quick definition for our audience um, and uh, just level set with everybody here. Um, a decentralized trial is uh, is a clinical trial that is taking advantage of technology or processes that can enable visits to take place outside of a traditional research site. And so this is being done increasingly, certainly among pharma in the context of multi-center research, but also among researchers more broadly, really for, for two main reasons. Some are patient reasons and some are business reasons. From a patient perspective, people are doing this to improve access, experience, representation, retention in trials by removing some of the geographic and other barriers that stand in the way. But it's also worth noting that people are doing this for business reasons as well, just simply for business continuity uh, with so much possible disruption in the environment that can prevent a person from getting to a research site. Uh, this seems to be at least some of the driving force around decentralization today. But Joanne, so much of making this happen is linked back to some of, some of the digital measurement and digital monitoring tools that are out there. So I wonder if you can start by sharing some perspective on how do these digital monitoring tools play a role in, in clinical trials that are decentralized? Hi, thanks, Craig. Um, great explanation introducing decentralized trials um, and how we've come that far from the, the day where everyone had to go to the clinic. So I think over these past uh, couple of decades, or couple of decades, couple of years with the pandemic, it brought a lot of challenge and a lot of excitement around the expanse of such technologies that frankly have been around for quite a long time, actually, I guess since uh, many years we've been able to, you know, do wireless communication through different ways. And I think with the onset of smartphones has really expanded the reach. And so these tools are really instrumental in actually engaging and empowering patients and, and uh, bringing that closer proximity for like a rural, rural out, uh, outreach to more face-to-face -face telemedicine um, that sort of thing that can actually really improve clinical trial uh, results as well as uh, improve patient health outcomes, especially when it comes to tracking medication adherence, ensuring patients are staying on track for their medications in a trial. So the, the, the real boundaries in clinical trials that I, I always try to remind people exist are, um, are around patient safety and data quality, data integrity. Everything else is kind of either fictional or derivative, but these are the real constraints that we have to operate within. And so as you're thinking about these types of monitoring technologies, how do they either reach the minimum expectation of data quality and data integrity, or how can they actually upscale and up-level what we're doing when it comes to data quality? 
Well, so there's always the risk of when you involve a human, right? You're going to have some subjective results there, right? Whether it's entering, a, you know, a check mark that you actually on an app you said I took my medicine, that sort of that sort of uh, subjective data point. So what the tools do nowadays uh, will actually provide higher quality data and objective adherence data. So it's a passive collection that doesn't necessarily involve a human emotion which could actually trigger a bit of noise or a little bit of you know, unclarity or unclear results in data. So when you have passive type uh, products using sensor technology and keep it as low technology as possible, especially for patients that don't have you know, technology in their homes, it actually benefits a decentralized trial model. Because if you are having a population that are pretty tech savvy, and again, it depends on the therapeutic area, right? But if you have um, patients that don't have access to smartphones, to internet, that sort of thing, these digital tools can still be effective because they can still track and, and monitor outside of technology, which is really what a benefit is. And that objective, accurate data is what we call a missing link, honestly, in a supply chain for visibility from uh, the, the journey of the actual medication in the drug product. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about what we're actually upskilling here when it comes to adherence monitoring in clinical trials. What's baseline? What's gold standard today when it comes to adherence monitoring in clinical trials? That's a, that's a good one. Um, really, it's very difficult, actually, to track the baseline. I mean, you can um, do what we've been doing all along. Uh, most researchers, they use, um, you know, like I said, they, they track either from someone's subjective mark saying, I've took, taken my dose. But we talk about electronic health records. We talk about refill counts. We talk about all of that. But the baseline has to be, where do you start with monitoring adherence is basic is is at a subject is at an objective level of just including did i take a dose and how do you track that dose right yeah i, I mean, mean for for a clinical trial with an investigational product i mean we um we ask people to self-report or we count the number of pills left in the bottle at their next visit that's and right that's what we've got i remember one anecdote from a patient uh, story years ago of a patient coming into the clinic telling the investigator and the coordinator they think that the pills this month were different and when asked why it was uh, right that uh, they seem to float in the toilet instead of sink right we don't really know what they're taking or when they're taking it or uh, uh, or what time they're taking it we don't know if they're taking a drug holiday on the weekend and tripling up on the dose on Monday to play catch up. And perhaps that's why they're having that adverse event. There are so many unknowns that we have when all we have is either a, a diary record that I, I think I took it. We don't know if mm, that was yeah. completed in the parking lot or yes. if uh, we're just looking at an empty pill bottle, feeling proud of ourselves when the bottle was dumped out just before the patient walked in. Right. So, Craig, we actually see that data over these past 20 years. It's really quite, um, I don't want to use the, lar the word alarming, but it's a bit alarming. So we can track per unit dose. So even rather than just a pill bottle opening, which is good too, we actually can track from a blistered medication right down to a unit dose. These are the types of solutions available. And what that shows is uh, what we call a de-blistering effect. So if you're, if you're talking about patient safety and drug efficacy and toxicity, you would see that all of a sudden, oh my heavens, this patient literally took out 14 pills within a minute. And then as, as a researcher and as a drug sponsor, a pharmaceutical sponsor, you think, why are they doing that? We have stability on that product for a reason. And all of a sudden, the pills are out. It could be a titrated product. We have no idea. But at that point, this is what is a very, very important timestamp of, of high quality data that we need to look at. And, and we do see it, it is proven with real world evidence that recall bias and e-diaries are actually much higher reported than using a objective measurement tool. 
Now there have to be uh, quite a few interesting innovative approaches for um, for helping me to monitor adherence in in a clinical trial, but also some really interesting challenges here. Sometimes I can distribute my pills in a bottle, but very often in a clinical trial, I'm using blister packs because I haven't uh, finished uh, measuring and having confidence in the stability of my pills to put them together in a bottle. Are you yeah. seeing different solutions emerging that can help to conform to those different situations? And can they scale and actually get meaningful adoption? Yeah, that's where we're, we're headed. Um, what we are seeing is a transition, um, a more adoption actually going, especially in North America, which are primarily have been bottle uh, run trials. Blister packaging technology is actually providing such fine tuned data high quality data that to go kind of backwards to bottles is really kind of make you scratch your head. But again, it's the therapeutic area where it depends. It depends on the drug product. Um, but also um, we have seen through that de-blistering, by the way, one particular episode of that in a trial, it turned out that in a clinical trial, they tend to be, the cards tend to be quite big and, and unwieldy. And so it turned out it was actually a, a, an issue with the size of the product, the card, and the patient population did not like that. So when we talk about patient experience, these are things that this type of data can provide a sponsor saying, wow, you know, we really thought we had uh, understood our patient population, but maybe we did not. And this type of data really helps curve that and mold it for, for the consumer and final commercial use to help, you know, determine exactly how it should be packaged. In an in a opiate pain study, as an example, we can actually see that they don't need 30 pills. We can actually dispense it now as per FDA guidelines into a blister format of perhaps five or 10 dose, depending on what the, uh, whether it's acute or chronic condition. So there's lots of opportunity. You know, for folks in the audience that aren't as familiar, for investigational medicines and clinical trials from pharma companies for medicines that are not yet approved, most of them are blistered. And so yeah. it's, um, while commercially we're very used to bill bottles in this country in the U.S., um, as, a, as a research participant, people and as an, a, a research site, most are actually used to blisters. And again, that's more because of our lack of long-term stability data anyway. So it fits very well, Joanne, uh, to what you were saying. Any other um, concerns or um, uh, thoughts here in terms of the making it work? You mentioned earlier, as far as supply chain, can we fit these new technologies into the supply chain of getting a medicine um, from our manufacturing sites to the research sites? Um, or, or do we need special new partners to bring in the mix? No, actually, you, I mean, depends again on the solution you're using, right? And it also depends on how much technology is involved to track that uh, digitally. So as an example, if you have patients and you want them to engage regularly with a cell phone and taking pictures of QR codes or taking pictures of themselves or videos, etc. That again, is what we call a broad stroke approach, right? So our purpose in life is to help the people that are non adherent to medicine, and to help get them back on health. And as you pointed out, right, to potentially um, uh, avert a serious adverse event, right, with a patient that could be related to patients not taking medicine as prescribed. So we like to focus in on that. So we like to think that no, a patient doesn't have to, you know, wind up a, a, a battery, change a battery, plug something in. So we try to keep that in mind as well. And I think that's going to be a lot of um, uh, swaying of what technologies are embraced by certain sponsors in the clinical supply, but it does help track a pill an investigational drug product per pill has a unique identifier right down to its own pill from the moment it's manufactured, shipped to the site or the central depot, out to a patient. And if we're talking remotely, a patient can literally do a contactless payment and that or a contactless payment, like a contactless payment, that quick and populate the data to a uh, uh, sort of to a cloud to anyone who needs it. So it's pretty. Thank impressive. you so much, Joanne. I uh, I know that your contact information is in the chat. I did promise Ainsley that I would help to get us back on time, and I see the fabulous Lorraine Marchand is in the wings, oh, ready okay. to come on out. 
So uh, Jerry, we'll turn back over to you. And thanks again, Joanne. Thanks, Craig. Nice seeing you. Thank you, Craig. And thank you, uh, Joanne, for, uh, for coming on and giving us uh, that perspective uh, around uh, decentralized uh, clinical trials and uh, you know, how digital health is, is really affecting a very, very important uh, piece uh, around medication adherence and stuff. So thank you very much uh, to both of you uh, for coming on uh, and taking us into the last half hour uh, of our symposium. We're on the home stretch. I see we have just under, no, just over 120 folks uh, logged in and watching. Some of you I see have been on since the very beginning. So kudos to everybody. Uh, just uh, make sure you get that cup of coffee uh, into you to, to, to see at the rest of the event. Um, and we are gonna very shortly move on to Lorraine and Rachel in just one moment. Um, it is National Coffee Day, by the way, as well, uh, as well as World Health Day. So uh, Dunkin' Donuts is not sponsoring the symposium, but I just thought I would put that out there. So we have the energy to get on to uh, listening to our last two interviews. A reminder that the Breakthrough Alliance Challenge is, um, is open and live right now. So if you are a digital health uh, startup um, or a founder that has a digital, uh, digital health solution, uh, please uh, visit the uh, Breakthrough Alliance Challenge application page, which uh, Ansley and Ayana should be putting into the chat now, um, to apply for this zero equity, zero fee challenge um, that is being hosted by HitLab and the Breakthrough Alliance. This is made up of a lot of various prominent uh, thought leaders and organizations uh, that really are in charge of identifying and uh, sourcing the next uh, big emerging technologies that are going to make that difference in the future. Um, and it would be great uh, to, to have as many folks apply. So we have a really good pool to choose our finalists from who are going to be presenting at the symposium. I'm sorry, the summit. This is a symposium at the summit at the end of the year in November. Um, and uh, one of the days, like I mentioned, is actually live in person in New York City. So uh, please do visit the uh, symposium, uh, sorry, the summit uh, registration page uh, to find out how you can be there in person. Tickets are limited. So please do apply early.